He is no stranger for people who have been to our international skills fora. He has worked for many, many, many years in the field of education. He still does. He's a deputy director general and deputy group chief at the sectors group at ADB. So let, please give it up for Mr. Sung Sub Ra. No, 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 no. It doesn't work. Please give it up for Mr. Sung Sub Ra. Thank you. Um, the, one of my friends told me, uh, usually after lunch, uh, we are having a so-called soft neck syndrome. That's quite uh, not just only, and then also another, then uh, that's quite uh, uh, serious disease <laughs> and symptom. Uh, perhaps we need to go and doctor get prescription. But hope that oh, ma many of you already overcome that uh, syndrome. All right, so this is very uh, challenging uh, session because many of you are uh, joining after lunch with this soft neck syndrome, perhaps some of you have it. Uh, but let's uh, work together, overcome that syndrome. Today we have uh, five uh, distinguished uh, the vice chancellor and the president. Uh, from India, Korea, uh, in the Indonesia, and also the Sri Lanka, all those. Uh, it's great pleasure. I think it, in the morning we have two sessions. We talk about the global trends and challenges we are facing. You know, we also talking about, you know, digitalization as one of big challenge and opportunity. At the same time, we talk about climate change. Climate challenge is a uh, serious now to us is a real we have this intertwined challenge came to us then here we want to discuss about what would be roles of the uh, university to really uh, prepare our student uh, so the so that they can prepare the uh, uh, new uh, uh, the, the challenges but more importantly how university can play a role for the nation, uh, the nation to prepare and overcome these challenges. This is not just only about student. It's not only that. It's beyond. We are now thinking about. We need to think about role of a university, just not only university but community, and also the country and and beyond the country for global uh, challenges. Here, uh, we, I like to introduce very quickly our distinguished speaker, the panelists here. First, next to me is uh, <clears throat> Madame Anju Sharma. Uh, she is the, uh, the additional uh, chief secretary from Gujarat and distinguished uh, careers from India. I think the uh, interesting part I saw that uh, she also um, I had a PhD from the Pandit Energy University. I visited it some time back when the uh, Prime Minister Modi at that time was your the uh, chief secretary, uh, chief minister. And she has so many, but I just kick because we want to more focus on content. Second one, second, I like to uh, the, introduce the uh, the president Chang uh, Jae Hak, Chang Jae Gook. He is the, uh, the president of the Dongso University in Busan in Korea. At the same time, he is the president of the Korea Council for uh, University Education, just like University Council is uh, chairman of that. Um, now, the, I like also the, <coughs> the uh, introduce the, um, <coughs> the rector, the Ojat uh, Darujat. And uh, he is now the rector at the Universitas uh, uh, Tobuka, and uh, he has also the, <clears throat> the uh, <clears throat> PhD, uh, uh, PhD there, and he is also not president of the uh, Asian Association of Open University, AAOU, uh, for a second, second ex consecutive term. So I think this is maybe history of the AAOU uh, journey. So he's a second term, uh, the, <clears throat> now he's doing that. Now that I have a little bit more gender balance, the, I'd like to introduce the uh, Vice Chancellor, uh, uh, Kenigadara. 
The, she is vice chancellor from the Rajarat University of Sri Lanka. Uh, she is uh, the PhD and the professor in the agriculture system here. But uh, the, she has been uh, in the Sri Lanka University uh, the system more than 20 years. In fact, the, uh, we ADB also we have uh, some project with Rajarata University. And uh, <clears throat> now the last thing, the, the, because it's the home country, so <laughs> the last one, <laughs> the, the Dr. Tisho uh, Lokilo, the, he is now the president of the Batangas State University. <laughs> Batangas State University is a national engineering university. On the top, he is also the uh, the chairman of the national innovation. He was executive director of the National Innovation Council. Also, my understand you are also president of the uh, Philippine University Association. So, it's so quite uh, very important. Uh, the we have it, uh, the speakers and panelists here. Now, the uh, in fact, I have two set of questions. The uh, the first question I. I uh, want to ask you a bit more broad one, you know, <clears throat> a little bit different from the, what we discussed by the change after listening session one and session two. In the morning, session one and session two, we talk about two intertwined challenges now coming to us. That was digital. Second one is that the climate change. I just wanted to ask all the panelists. Uh, just uh, each all same question. Each of you can briefly. Uh, explain how you really, one thing you want to share with us, what you do to responding this to intertwine the challenges at the, as a, the head of the university and also you are head of the uh, chairman of the university council. In your cases, not only the university, but you has a big, big role right, in the government also the, working on that. I just wanted to ask you what, what you doing as a, you know, the president and vice president, uh, the, the vice chancellor, to really to overcome and address these intertwined challenges. I mean, you can perhaps talk about what you're doing in terms of curriculum development, or you can also show your experience what you're doing, working with uh, other, uh, promoting the cross-sectoral, cross disciplinary work, or you can also share the uh, the your work with other university. I will stop here. Maybe the madam first. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. So um, all of you know about uh, demographic dividend of uh, India, and uh, I'll give you some statistics that uh, the average age of India as of now is 29. And 63% uh, of our population is between 15 to 59 age group. And according to one estimate, we will have 1.04 billion working population by 2030. Also, uh, I'll give you another statistics that while India has a GR, that is a gross enrollment rate for higher education at 21, at about 21, only 4.7% of Indian people have received formal skill training. So uh, skill in the present scenario, as you all know, given by these uh, statistics, it remains a very important challenge for Indian population, Indian policymakers, and for the Indian industry as well, because while Indians are receiving formal education in a big way, when it comes to formal skill training, there are still a lot of gaps which the government and the academia together, they are wanting to plug. Another interesting statistics I would give you from the World Economic Forum report, the World Jobs report, that 44%, almost 44% of skills all over the world are going to be disrupted in the next five years. And six in 10 workers will require skill training to meet the challenges that come up with Industry 4.0 or with the advancements in technology. So these are the challenges in which we are working and we are now focusing a lot on skill development. We are focusing a lot on upskilling, reskilling the Indian workforce and aligning them 
with the emerging technologies and giving a lot of industry 4.0 centric uh, training, uh, developing the ecosystem for that. And also academia is a very important partner. And our new education policy 2020, it emphasized a lot of skill development and vocational education to be put together with formal education when it comes to uh, formal education institutions. Great. Uh, the India, the, um, the, the great to hear that uh, your, the population, the average age is 29 only. <laughs> but now next, uh, sorry to ask the President Chang that the Korea has an aging problem on top of these two problems. So over to you. I really, I really envy you. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm, first of all, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to this wonderful conference uh, today and also on this panel. Uh, I came all the way from uh, uh, Korea, but you're giving me only three minutes to talk. How gracious of you. Yeah. Um, the Korean universities are currently uh, facing or grappling with the three uh, major uh, issues. One is, as uh, uh, he mentioned, we are witnessing a significant uh, uh, drop in population. Uh, last year, the birth rate uh, in Korea was only 0 0.79, uh, 0 0.78. So that means, you know, um, in 18 years, uh, you know, put it into perspective, uh, student, uh, babies born last year was only 240,000 babies were born last year. So all the uh, seats available for freshmen in Korea is 50, uh, 550,000. Uh, seats are available for uh, freshman uh, uh, people in the college. So you will, you will see uh, what will happen in 18 years time. The second challenge we have is uh, all the Korean universities are facing significant uh, financial difficulties due to a 15 year freeze on uh, tuition uh, fees. Uh, as you know, uh, Koreans uh, really put a lot of uh, uh, pr uh, put priority on education. So all the people uh, have something to say about higher education. Uh, so the politicians, uh, they sometimes go in, go like a populistic uh, uh, in a policies, and they uh, forced us to freeze the tuition uh, fees, uh, you know, for 15 years. So that's as a result all the Korean universities are facing uh, financial difficulties. And third, uh, we are, what we are facing is astonishingly uh, burdensome regulatory and the legal uh, framework uh, that hinders uh, uh, universities from embracing uh, innovation in the era of digital transformation. Um, I will talk a little bit more about this, but you know, the current government is trying to lift uh, all these regulatory uh, or legal uh, hindrance uh, to encourage universities to be more in innovative. Uh, but still, uh, all the universities are challenging these three uh, very difficult uh, challenges. So it's a really important role for universities to overcome uh, these uh, three challenges. Um, so we'll talk more later on these issues later. Yeah. Well noted about your concern that three minutes only we give all the way you come to, from Korea. <laughs> but it's quite uh, interesting now that India, we talk about population dividend. When Korea, they talk about declining the population and I think the world's lowest population, the fertility rate we are talking about. Right? And then the, all the policy constraints from government. Now we have it. Um, perhaps the most dynamic uh, the president in Philippines. <laughs> so uh, the, the professor, the Rockola, yeah. over to you. Thank you very much, Force to uh, ADB for inviting me here and have this opportunity to share with you some issues and concern in Philippine higher education, specifically those affecting state universities and colleges. This is my first time to attend the skills forum in ADB. My first time, and yet uh, I was invited to be a resource person. So, in the Philippines, uh, we are a third world country. And I don't know if you will be proud that tertiary higher education is free. You know, those who are in state universities and colleges. We have uh, more than 2,000 HEIs or higher education institutions in the country. 
of that over that's 2,000 that small, medium, large universities and colleges. Of that uh, over 2,000 higher education institutions, I represent 114 state universities and colleges. And uh, there are also more than 100 local universities and colleges, those created by local government units. Now, uh, as you know, Philippines is that of a growing population. We have over 100 million population. And in terms of students, you know, in our uh, HEIs, we have over 4,000 students in, enrolled in higher education institutions in the Philippines. And uh, in this over 4 million students in higher education institutions, almost half or around one half, uh, over 2 million, are enrolled in public higher education institutions. In public HCIs, tuition fees and miscellaneous fees are fully free. And because of that, students who are enrolled in private universities tend to transfer or they now uh, have an influx to our state universities and colleges. But the issue is on our absorptive capacity. Can our state university absorb? So we can only absorb or we can only accept those what we can absorb. So now this, this post challenge in the Philippine higher education, why? Because recently the government is not giving full subsidy to those students enrolled in uh, state higher education institutions, despite the fact that it is subscribed in the law that uh, they will be paid full, state universities will be paid full. So now those are the higher education institutions that absorb the deficiency of the payment for the tuition pay of our students. So it's now a challenge on us, higher education institution managers and leaders to compensate for this deficiency. Now on the uh, aspect or dimension on innovation, which is now getting the, the buzzword wherever you, you, you go. So the challenge is for us to innovate, of course, we have to ensure that these components or I should say elements of innovation must be present. The competent people, the infrastructure must be present. So it is now the challenge of school administrators or leaders to provide for this platform on top of what the government provides, the limited support that the government provides. So really it's how leaders can, can maximize the resources from private partners. So that's all for now. So um, the, I think the extremely important uh, uh, area you mentioned, touch upon how we really tap the private sector and the leverage their resources, work together. So uh, maybe we, we delve into this one a little bit detail later after. The, now the, I'd like to ask the rector, the, the OJAT, uh, so the Indonesia, your university is quite, Indonesia is one of the biggest country. I think the number one among the Muslim country. So you have not only domestic, uh, well, but uh, whatever you're doing have maybe big influence in other countries. So over to you. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Thank you very much, moderator, and good afternoon, everyone. Yeah. In this session, I would like to share uh, strategic issues in Indonesia, and one of the strategic issues in my country about the future of higher education is in regard with the digital transformations. And our government, through the Ministry of Education and Culture, put a lot of work uh, <clears throat> for the Directorate General for Higher Education. Uh, there are some programs, different programs uh, taken by the government, including, uh, but there are two major programs actually. The first one about uh, expanding or widening access to the internet. Indonesia is a developing country. We have about more than uh, 17,000 islands, and we have uh, five uh, main islands, including Java, and then Sumatra, Borneo, or Kalimantan, and then Sulawesi, Sulbas, and also Papua. So, uh, in the latest year, our government tried to develop uh, or build uh, BTS, uh, Beast Transfer Stations to make sure that all people are uh, living in remote islands, in a remote area can have access to the internet. 
uh, as we know that uh, mostly just only people uh, living in urban or the big city who have access to the internet, but not for people in uh, remote islands. And there are many, many Indonesian living in remote islands. So that's why our government put all of focus to build uh, BTS to provide access. Uh, providing access is very challenging in my country. Uh, as a rector of Unisabuka, is the only university, state university, employing uh, distance learning. Uh, and it is very challenging for me to provide online learning services for people living in remote island because they don't have access. So uh, that's why our government try a lot of work to widening access to the government, uh, to the people of Indonesia to access. This is the first issue. And the second issue about uh, enhancing uh, internet in uh, digital literacy level. It is also very challenging in my country because there are many people in my country, including student, new students, uh, join with my university, don't have uh, capacity. That's why we have a lot of work to educate them, to advise them how to use the internet, to computer, and this is a big issue. Uh, then our ministry, the Ministry of uh, Education and Culture, uh, very intensive uh, stating that it is very important for us to integrate to integrate the advance of technology in our institutional process, in teaching learning process. Uh, no, we are, uh, mm, this is a new entrance in my university actually after, uh, during and after COVID-19 outbreak. There are many conventional universities also adopt and adapt uh, distance learning model in my country. So, uh, you know, my university has been launched by the government established in, uh, for September in 1984, 13 years ago. Uh, so our industry is, uh, have a monopoly in terms of uh, distance education. But now, after, uh, during and after uh, COVID-19 outbreak, there are many conventional universities also offering distance learning. And this is a new policy from the government. And I think this is a good uh, to provide opportunity to all people and people to have uh, higher education. Educations. And then also uh, our government try to promoting massive open on courses, MOOCs uh, in my country by uh, establishing, establishing uh, Indonesian Cyber Education Institute. Indonesian Cyber Education Institute is uh, a marketplace for online learning services from the Indonesian, not only for uh, uh, state university, but also for private one. So it is very good. So. All Indonesian, uh, including general audience, can access to the uh, ICE Institute to have uh, uh, MOOCs or massive online courses. And this is very good to enhance in terms of uh, digital transformations. And then also uh, our government try to provide a uh, research grant uh, for all people, especially faculty members in different universities, including an university. And uh, that's why they, uh, there are many uh, faculty member uh, attending seminar like that to get to know uh, more deeply about uh, digital transformations. Thank you. Great, quite a detail uh, the introduction about your government initiative and your doing. Now we go to Rajarata University, the, the, the vice chancellor. Uh, Nikatara, uh, since we spent a bit time, so I try to move very quickly. Very shortly, can you uh, the, share the what you doing, universal level work, the government level, to uh, the address the uh, the intertwined challenge? I think that you are also from agriculture. Perhaps you can uh, offer a lot. But can you do a bit more briefly, so so that we can move to the second round of questions? Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. And first of all, thank you very much, ADB, for inviting me for this uh, skills forum. Just if we go back to five years, get a cross section of the university graduates, we can see very clearly around 20% of Sri Lankan graduates are from science and technology, where around 80% is from liberal arts where the country is finding and graduates are finding huge problem of finding employment. There was a lot of problems of their 
uh, employability. Recognizing them clearly, now the government is more towards increasing the graduates from science and technology, meantime, reducing the number of graduates from liberal arts and social sciences in order to find some solutions for the employability problems, as well as making our graduates employable and serve for the country and the globe. Parallel to that, starting 12 faculties of technologies, where are some of those faculties directly funded for their infrastructural development by the Asian Development Bank, the science and technology graduates or intakes from science and technology is increasing, whereas the the social sciences are reducing. So then maybe within another five years of time, we might not have a huge issue of employability because the science and technology graduates are increasing across whole country and all the graduates might be moved from science and technology. Meantime, thanks to the COVID pandemic, the Sri Lankan higher education system switched to the online education and digitization and digitalization potentials we are there like we touch upon those things now there are degree programs which are offered through online mode and a lot of digitization and digitalization efforts are accessed by the different universities in the whole country there are 17 government universities where whereas we have some more private universities as well at the same time making our graduates employable every university is getting a lot of concerns on putting up entrepreneurship culture inside the university where they are taught in the courses as well as creating such an environment for these graduates to train themselves before put, getting themselves to this world of work the entrepreneurial skills so that effort, that effort has been made up everywhere in the old government universities as well as private universities and the research outputs, maybe the inventions and innovations are commercializing to be benefited, to get a lot of benefits to the general public, where which was not there in the past. The research and development activities which are leading for the commercializable products, the universities are helping for commercializing them. And the, many of the products through the research from the universities are now in the market so then they, from that as well our graduates are giving up a lot of opportunities to go for research and development activities with commercializable outcomes and meantime the climate change which is a focal topic today we are talking about in the skills forum if i especially go to the rajarata university of sri lanka working with adb we are making all arrangements to put up a center of excellence in climate change studies which is the timely need for the country as well as we are trying to connect with other universities in sri lanka as well as some other sectoral universities to work with in the second round i might give you more information on this center thank you yes uh christ um I think your university is uh, the very unique in the sense you have a biosystem, agriculture, that also not only digital, you can also work on, contribute to the climate change or those issues. And also you will focus on STEM and the technical uh, the education, that's also quite well noted. Now to go to the uh, Madame Shama, the, on your the Kaushala Scale University offers I would say very unique, I think the uh, example to not only India, in other country, because there are a lot of research universities like MIT and Stanford. And then also in India, as you said, that because of the population dividend, et cetera, mushroom growth of the university. And then also many engineering school. However, their quality of education problem and also the collaboration with the industry academic uh, industry, that collaboration, not really happening. But your university doing excellent job that front. I understand you already have it, you are offering uh, short-term and long-term courses, including uh, the future-oriented courses, such as schools of a drone. You know, I can know what it's doing though. 
and then based on also industry, uh, industry demand. So can you share the experience of what, why are you doing that? And then uh, anything we can learn from you, not just on India and other country, because we needed the high, like, you know, rich, uh, rocket scientist. We need also blue color, but we need the middle. We connect this, sometimes we call this one gold color. So go to you. Yeah, so uh, as we discussed, everything finally boils on employability. So while uh, we are teaching, we're giving formal education to say about 75%, 80% or more than that people. But uh, when it comes to employability, what we are teaching should be really be able to make them earn a livelihood. So that is what the central theme is. And uh, as you all know that under our Make in India program, we are uh, entering a lot into modern technologies, including semiconductors now. And uh, the first semiconductor plant by Micron is also coming up in India. So given that it, it is, and especially given the growth rate of Gujarat, where uh, we are uh, moving um, uh, uh, in line with the uh, development in India with 8% of uh, G G uh, GDP shared by Gujarat alone, and our target is 10 per 10 10% now. So, uh, given that we are we created this university, which is Kaushalya, the skill university. So, the idea of this university is that we produce manpower, which is uh, uh, in line with the industry's demand, and uh, we uh, uh, anticipate and also gauge the situation, talk to the industry work out their requirements, and then accordingly we have curriculum. So we have put up a governance structure, which is uh, very much industry centric, which is in close collaboration with the industry. Industry is very uh, actively taken on board at various forum. Uh, Skill Development uh, Council we have for approving all the courses. In the Board of Studies also, uh, the industry is very actively represented. We have a very flexible curriculum. We uh, uh, draw the curriculum on the basis of uh, industry's demand. Plus, plus, we ensure that whatever we work out as a curriculum is in line with the regulator. That is a UGC, University Grant Commission. So we are trying to give a blend to the country whereby uh, employability and education can together come. So our theme is education with employability. So uh, we, under the broad framework of UGC approved guidelines, we work out the curricula. Number two is we are focusing on alternate pathways and a lot of upward mobili mobility. Uh, I'll give you an example. So there is a C2D and D2D. C2D is certificate to diploma and D2D is diploma to diploma. So what we are focusing on is that skill development should become highly upward looking. So if somebody has entered into a certificate course at the level of 12th, at the level of higher secondary, they should be able to get into higher education also at any point of time. So this we are facilitating, facilitating that if you have two years of certificate course after secondary uh, education, you can take, you can, you directly get admission into a diploma at the uh, third year level. And if you do another if you do a diploma program, then you directly get an admission into the degree program in the second year or in the third year, depending on the degree program. So we are merging all the uh, uh, available pathways and creating alternate pathways for the uh, students to, for the youth to upskill them at any moment. I'll give you an example. So uh, we are working, uh, we are affiliating industry institutes. So I'll give you an example here. So with the ArcelorMittal group, for example, you all know, we have created uh, an, a, um, an academy. So ArcelorMittal Academy, it uh, is affiliated to Kaushalya Skill University. So we offer a course in BSc in steel technology. Now we get diploma students there. They hire diploma students. These students are given a job, plus they are given uh, an internship, they are given a residential facility free of cost and they are given uh, they are imparted skill for three years and in three years they get a pg diploma along with a ug degree bsc steel technology plus pg diploma in steel technology when they get out and they get a full-time well worthy uh, uh, this uh, appointment 
Also, uh, we are bringing in industry in a big way in uh, setting up these skill in institutes. So a lot which the government cannot do, the industry is also able to collaborate. So we, their investment also facilitates uh, skill development and they are able to also um, uh, uh, embed on the job training on the uh, uh, in these curricula so you do it's a kind of a mix of the dual system of training and also uh, sometimes we have five semesters of uh, uh, theory uh, the university uh, program plus one year of apprenticeship and this apprenticeship is again uh, graded and it earns the credits so the total credits that you earn is also is given through the industry as well as through the um, uh, through the university so this is a uh, very innovative plank and uh, since you took up this topic of drones so uh, drones as you all know that uh, it's a uh, it's this kind of robotics it's ai it's machine learning and uavs all together and uh, considering the uh, increasing use of drones in industry we have taken up a special uh, initiative to set up a school of drones which is unique kind in the world i would say because we are giving uh, training from flying uh, servicing flying manufacturing programming end to end in drones through an industry collaborated uh, uh, center of excellence so we give them flying licenses we have a remote pilot training organization which is recognized by ddca plus we have courses at the lower level the idea is to as you all know agriculture is very important for our country and in order to bring sustainability in agriculture especially when we are talking of uh, climate resilience at uh, this moment climate change and resilience so at this point sustainability is very important because as you all know world has a fertilizer crisis and fertilizers are getting very expensive moreover everybody is looking for organic uh, pro produce so uh, drone spraying which is also called precision which is a part of precision farming it reduces the use of pesticides and use of fertilizers both so our honorable prime minister is focusing a lot one uh, drone for each farm so that whatever fertilizers and pesticides you use so every ton of fertilizer that you save is the actual saving and whatever pesticides that you save are saving for your own health and for the environment as a whole so in keeping that in mind we are taking drones to e to the across the length and breadth of the country and we have created a robust ecosystem for that so that the farmers get training in operating the drones a large number of drones can be manufactured and uh, very amply training can be provided in drones at all levels and at all places even in remote centers okay. this is really excellent uh, also the innovative way to hit both uh, the digital and at the same time the the, the sustainability and now the uh, go to the uh, president Zhang. Um, you are the president of Dongso university which is very well known for academic industry collaboration and at the beginning as you said that the first question so many challenges you are facing since you are uh, the outside of the soul and then the aging all those problems there at the same time, you are the president of the Korea Council of University Education. The, I just wanted to ask you a question that what the, the, the um, you know, the, the challenge you are facing, yeah, I would say so many challenges you are facing, <laughs> it's not, but uh, your way, one of the, uh, the strategies that I think the maybe three I thought, one is that the industry academic collaboration I think Tongso University also very active for international cooperation also. Uh, and uh, also you are also leading university for the promoting also innovation. Uh, I just want to give you just all of you two minutes each and because we will be, be quick and then go respond. <laughs> Only two minutes now? Yeah, two minutes all of you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Getting shorter and shorter. <laughs> Uh, as you said, you know, at uh, Dongso University is famous for um, academia and uh, industry cooperation and collaboration. And we have been doing this uh, for many years. And uh, of course, changing the culture of university is quite difficult because uh, 
most of the faculty members are very conservative and they don't want to do something else outside their uh, own uh, field of study. So they are sometimes very hesitant to collaborate or outreach uh, industry. Uh, so but we have to change the, ch uh, the culture of this kind of a conservatism. So what we have been doing is that we were trying to generate uh, more success stories uh, by collaborating uh, academia and uh, uh, industry. And then we uh, uh, let, them, let the faculty members know that this is a really good thing to do. For example, uh, our university is, <coughs> oh, excuse me, our university is famous for uh, filmmaking and the digital contents. Uh, our uh, uh, university is located in Busan, Korea, and I don't know whether you heard of uh, Busan, but Busan is famous for Busan International Film Festival. So all the you know uh, famous movie stars and Korean K-pop stars are gathering in Busan. So if you want to see uh, you know one of the uh, K-pop stars, you have to visit Korea. Uh, Busan, Busan, and come to our university. That you can meet uh, BTS and whatever you like. <laughs> but anyway, what we have do been doing was we are closely working together with the Busan International Film Festival, and we invited uh, uh, renowned uh, movie or film uh, personalities to our university so that we can closely work together with the industry. And Busan is uh, trying to become a hub of uh, Asia's film uh, uh, production. So we are working all uh, together with the city of Busan uh, to make this uh, dream come true. And another uh, way of, of generating a uh, success story is that we have a, a, a distinctive uh, example. Uh, it's called uh, class selling. We basically sell our courses to industry. So the industry, you know, a company uh, buying our courses so what they do is, uh, you know, all the uh, companies have their issues, right? For example, they uh, put, uh, 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 they introduce new products uh, in the market, then they should have a new uh, marketing strategy. So by purchasing our uh, class uh, industry and our faculty members and also, um, you know, students work together throughout the semester uh, to come up with the solutions. Uh, for this, uh, for the for the, this company, so by doing this, we are uh, generating many, many, many different kinds of uh, success stories, and that we uh, let the, our faculty members know uh, how the uh, the result of the outcomes, and then uh, the culture is beginning to change, and then uh, the university becomes more innovative, and uh, we are going forward to that uh, that direction. So I think it's very important to generate the success stories so that we can uh, have uh, this kind of innovative uh, uh, momentum uh, in our university. Uh, it's more than two minutes though. Yeah, the, but the worry that uh, we noticed that we have to go to university to meet K-pop stars and uh, movie stars. So now, <laughs> uh, now we go to the, uh, the president, Rokello. The, you are not only you are president and also same time chairman of the National University Council. I think your university is one of the leading university uh, innovation and industry partnership. You are also working with the DTI, uh, developing big program now. So can you share the uh, what you're thinking and how you can really uh, overcome the challenge we discussed a while ago, particularly in the context of the future two direction the climate change and digital. Uh, over the years, the Philippines is performing well in Global Innovation Index. Now we rank, I think, 56 out of, uh, uh, we rank better than last year. However, if you will be looking at the granular level, there are areas that Philippines is not performing well. Let's say on research and uh, human resource and research, I think we rank 88 out of 132. Also on uh, infrastructure, we rank, I think, 86 out of 132. And on institutions, I think we rank 79 out of 132. As a university, I think, uh, in particular, Batanga State University, as the National Engineering University, as declared last year by law, Republic of 11694, we can contribute well on increasing the capability of human resource just to be up the performance of the country in general. As uh, 
Others may know, Batangas State University as the national university is mandated by law to support other HEIs, not only state university, in providing for uh, progressive leadership in terms of curriculum development, specifically on engineering and technology. I think uh, three years ago, the Batanga State University's Technology Park was uh, declared by law or proclaimed by the president as the uh, special economic zone. And we are now busy. We are now occupied really in putting our resources and attention on really establishing that innovation hub for not only for Batanga State University, for, but for the country. That is what we are proposing for DTI. That this will be an ecosystem for the university, for the industry even, and the government as a platform for innovation. And uh, we are uh, happy that over the years, with our limited resources, we're able to continuously develop it. But however, we need to, we need to uh, accelerate. And that's why we, we now partner with the industry and even articulate it with the government just for us to have this acceleration of human resource development and even on research productivity. So as the National University for Engineering recently, our Board of Regents approved the NEED, N-E-E-D program, National Engineering Education Development Program. It is a five component program that basically will profile engineering education, will accelerate outcomes based education and engineering, will also accelerate accreditation in engineering. At the same time, we are mandated to provide for the training of engineers in the country in terms of faculty members teaching in our universities. And lastly, the component is on accelerating collaboration among engineering universities in the country. So that is now occupying Patanga State University and uh, hopefully we can contribute to increasing the, the uh, research productivity of the country in general. Thank you. It, uh, thanks very much. I think the, uh, we have only eight minutes left. Uh, so extremely sorry to uh, the, uh, the, the the Vice Chancellor Kenny uh, Gandara and also the, the Rector uh, I will give only one minute each. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. So the uh, the uh, just uh, um, in the case of Indonesia, you are leading person for the online education. Yeah. So can you give the one liner? You know, yeah. uh, what do you want to do? And then also for I think the for uh, uh, Vice Chancellor Ginidandra, you are unique in the person. You are doing uh, uh, technical education, right? That. But at the same time, I'm talking Kinigandra. You're also working on climate change and digital. So one line, each of you. So. OK, thank you so much. Uh, uh, I think to achieve a great success in the future, in our future success, it is very difficult for us without help from others. Uh, also, in uh, developing our institution, the Open University of Indonesia. We try to develop our institution by developing a networking, good networking with others. Uh, currently, we serve more than uh, 500 million, uh, 500,000 uh, students. 500,000 students. Uh, it is a big uh, student body uh, spread out, spread out all over the country, <clears throat> and. Mostly of them is young generation, shifting from uh, working people to young generations. And we are also very uh, rigid in implementing quality assurance system, internal quality assurance system in our university, and try we to uh, share with others, with other universities. We adopt uh, AAOU quality assurance framework in my university, and then uh, this best practice also share with others. So uh, we are getting involved in many uh, different forums. In ASEAN, we have uh, OU Pipe. OU Pipe uh, consists of five open universities in ASEAN countries, like Indonesia, uh, UPOU in Philippines, and also OUSL in uh, Sri Lanka, Sukhothai Tamatirat, and others. 
we uh, conduct annual uh, conference with others just to share our knowledge and experience and uh, sharing our best practice. And also we have uh, AOU, ASEAN Association of Open Universities. Uh, this is a good uh, association to share with others about our practice. And by doing that, I think we can grow together. Thank you. Thank you. Just to share the climate, the Center of Excellence in Climate Change attached to the Rajarati University of Sri Lanka, why we plan to establish this center. Climate change is a timely felt scenario for the whole country as well as whole globe. So therefore, the right research and development and outcome based research and development activities training the needed all stakeholders with respect to the climate change and educating all categories of the stakeholders with respect to climate change is much necessary in order to feel them and the climate change, I mean, to make them climate change resilient. Hence, this center was established at Rajarata University of Sri Lanka to make outcome oriented research and development activities with respect to climate change and then assessing different climate change vulnerability to build resilience at local regional and national level and educating training and making students aware the policy makers and the general public on climate change and the mitigation and adaptation strategies and even to formulate regional policies and help these policy makers as well as implementers with respect to climate change to work with a sensitive mind. Rajarati University having six faculties, the management, social sciences, applied sciences, technology, agriculture, social sciences, we all are working together in this center in a multidisciplinary manner in order to find solutions for the climate changes as well as mitigation and adaptation strategies. And once this center is built up, we are planning to get together with all the universities in Sri Lanka and even beyond, going beyond to the region and working with the regional specific climate change scenarios and work with a better mindset up to find solutions and good approaches and to become a more climate resilient. Thank you. Great are you. <laughs> so the, the, uh, that the, you, the, the climate change hub and the laboratory, that's uh, one of the very excellent example. We have uh, many questions here. The first question is about the, the quality education aspect. What is the most common ecosystem? Uh, yeah. What is the most common ecosystem we need to consider for higher education in producing quality education for our nation, especially in gaining and training and skill education. Also, a second question I will already ask to save our time. So I cover two questions in this session. Policy and political agenda will be one factor in rethinking future of education in country. Please elaborate how we can make it more effective way to implement these factors um, these factors uh, to make our higher education look greater for our country. So first questions regarding this quality education in producing higher education, uh, the, uh, the quality education for our nation. I'd like to ask the, uh, the madam and also the, uh, the President Zhang, uh, just only one line. Yeah, just five seconds. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think experiential and on-the-job learning and uh, innovation ecosystem is the most important. Job learning and innovation. And innovation. I think uh, we have three ways of learning things. One is uh, learn by uh, uh, head, they learn by your heart, and they learn by uh, your hand. You know, I, in this era of uh, tr uh, digital transformation, transformation and AI, I think uh, learn by heart uh, and uh, learn by hand is more important than learn by head. So that's the, uh, the key, yeah, ex that's key really, words yeah. that I want to uh, say. Yeah, that's, I think already, <laughs> you want to say one word? 
Only yeah, so, uh, <laughs> uh, that's what I said. Like on the job learning, getting experience is more imp more important because the kind of uh, jobs that and uh, that are coming up, and then if we have to focus on employability, it's not only uh, knowing but learning how to do it is also very important. And uh, we believe that a lot of universities in their curricula and their pedagogy, curricula of course remains the same, but it's a pedagogy that is most important. And in the pedagogy, they leave out this part. So you teach filmmaking, but when it comes to actually shooting the film, you don't know anything. You don't know which angle to shoot at. So you may be knowing 45 degree angle or 30 degree angle, but at what and how to, how to reach that, it doesn't uh, work out. So I asked Bolti, <laughs> and on the, on the uh, second question, uh, I'd like to ask the uh, president of Kuala. Just, uh, just 10 seconds, uh, the uh, political and uh, the policy agenda will be one of very important factor in rethinking future of education. The, how to elaborate, how to implement it this way, how do we really help enable that, to address those. Just one line up. Okay. <laughs> So, <laughs> one line, I will try. <laughs> I think this must be a whole of the nation approach. The policy must address the people, it must address the university, it must address the industry. So, it must be a whole of the nation approach because I observe since this morning we're talking a lot of problems. These are multifaceted problems and cannot be solved by one person alone, by one sector alone. I propose this must be government, university, industry approach. Thank you. Yeah, great. Uh, now they go to, now the gender balance go to Madam first. <laughs> After that, I'll come to uh, the director, Oja. The confidence, right? We talk about now the future digital transformation and climate change. We need a different set of confidence. What are the confidence you want, you think is most important to uh, uh, the uh, change the curriculum and prepare the, your student for the future. Just only one confidence. Also, go to the now the, uh, the rector, Ojan. Just only one line. <laughs> Changing the curriculum is the number one in university education to face the challenges for the climate change related digitalization. So, we have to address them. Of course, some universities are addressing, while some are getting ready to address. So in order to make it, the needed changes are to be made. Other than that, I don't have time to explain much. Is it that one now to go to uh, the rector? I'm just echoing. Uh, yeah, I think uh, curriculum is oh, really important because curriculum is just like a recipe. This is not only about the text, but only about all our experience we will, uh, about the student in our university. So it is very important we provide a curriculum in such a way to provide experience, uh, knowledge uh, for our student uh, to get success in the future in, in the society. Thank you. The great, uh, the thanks to the all panelists. Add, yep. Is that uh, possibly ADB could consider setting up a global employability fund? for all the countries so that uh, the network of uh, skills across the countries could be shared. And second is that you could also have a, uh, a seed fund for the budding uh, innovators who could be extended support. Yeah, that's a great idea. I think the Ayako and Santi already heard about that. <laughs> now the, uh, we are concluding this. I give the big applause to the, all the panelists. Um, the, it was, uh, I just went a one-liner. I think the, this group represented about 2.0 billion population. <laughs> so it's the world, I think they're about 25% of population. This is a very important group. And then they also, now we discuss uh, how the challenge high diverse requirement for the university. University education is very different from K-12 and other. So here we're talking about local context in the aging problem, but you have also the dividend, the demographic dividend. But at the same time, we have also a lot of challenges, you know, the climate change, digitalization, and other issue there. And also some of you uh, have also problem with the, employ, uh, the, the uh, improving the improvability for the student. But today, uh, they all mention about the importance of the curriculum development. 
re, the reshaping the curriculum, reshaping the way you're doing the business in the, in the, in the higher education, and then also the industry collaboration, and also supporting the national agenda. You know, uh, and, then the, and then also one, we talk about in terms of way, uh, the, the delivering the delivering the education more. We've been, we've been very much fixed based on the fixed education, fixed based education, but we today talk about the online education and another way to, to really share. Also, you mentioned about another one, experiential learning, the importance of that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much also, Sung Subra, for moderating the session. And I'm sure you all learned a special technique right now, how you give five minutes, in three minutes, one minute, ten seconds, we were all waiting for, you have time for one word. But, <laughs> but why the questions were becoming more and more complicated, right? So thank you so much. And this concludes our plenary sessions. And in a moment we will share the program you can choose from, just very, very briefly, and Shanti will help me, but there are two more things. Number one, of course, here is the summary. I saw many people took a picture already, and sometimes I'm in the way, I'm sorry, not that transparent. Secondly, there is a QR code, a QR code every day. Maybe you have noticed that in nearly every meeting you have to sign. You didn't have to sign, but we have a QR code, <laughs> because we like QR codes, apparently. <laughs> so very digital. So. You can go to the, your home button, to your home button on the agenda, and you can actually, when you go to the home button, there is a session called 17th October Attendance. You go to the home button, to the home page of your app, Attendance, 17th Attendance, and then you can either click and you can take a QR code, or you check in code 17 Octo. Then when you press enter, you have registered for the day. I don't know if I can... No, no dinner without, without check-in, I cannot say, but I wish. <laughs> but please register now. We need your registration. We don't, we don't have a signature. So you don't have to sign anything, but please... We give you 30 seconds more for that. Does it work? Everybody managed? It's not working. Okay, so we might do an extra, extra session for that in one of the breakouts. Okay. Okay, so, but it should be the home button, 17th October attendance. You can then click on that and then there is check in either with a QR code or with the Octo. 17 Octo. Just remember 17 Octo, you don't need to see it anymore. 17 Octo, just remember. Like at school, remember when the teacher said, remember? 17 Octo. Okay, we have to continue. One of the most important announcements today is we are going to divide into four rooms. You have to take your belongings with you before we, when we go for the coffee break you have to take your belongings with you, except the latest iPhone. The latest iPhone you can leave on the chair. I take care. <laughs> yeah? Otherwise, please take your belongings. Okay? Got it, right? So, because when the coffee break is over, the rooms will be separated into four. And we have a menu for you, and we have two ses breakout sessions back to back. You don't have to stay in the same room. You have about 10 minutes to go from one room to another. Shanti, what's on the program right after coffee break? Um, if you re recall the first day's um, theme is digital transformation. So the parallel sessions, um, the two of the parallel sessions will address this theme. The first is around school education, uh, tech inclusive approaches, so it addresses uh, issues around uh, assessment, issues around learning quality, 
um, innovation uh, and, uh, and different perspectives. This is this is one session which is around tech inclusive approaches to quality assessment and reforms to scale up uh, access. The second one is around the fourth industrial revolution and uh, tech enabled TVET. So the first one was around K-12 school education. The second is around TVET and the fourth industrial revolution. And we also have a third uh, parallel session, which is a round table of economists and round table of chief economists. And actually we have a very diverse panel coming from different backgrounds. Uh, two chief economists who are coming from, uh, one from Netflix and one from R3, which is a tech, tech company. And we also have two people representing monitoring, evaluation, uh, rigorous assessments and so on. So the idea is that they will, they will look into the importance of human capital development, um, economic returns to education, uh, monitoring and evaluation. So those are the three parallel sessions from three to four. So you have to make a choice. Nobody will take the choice for you. You go where your energy take you. I think that's normally the moment when the teacher says, silent class, right? Any teacher here? Who is a teacher? I need some advice how to get the attention of the students. Gong, oh, gong, okay, thank you. So back to back, we have another round. Of course, please check your program. There is room hall one, two, and three. You have to find your way. And then people are changing, moderators are changing, and we're gonna have a second round. So there will be three sessions about scaling innovative education project in South Asia, in hall one, in hall two, in Southeast Asia and the Pacific. And then we have another room, Central and West Asia and East Asia. So if you have a geographic orientation, you can either go to your home area and listen to examples from that part of the world. If you always feel like I'm always hearing about the countries I'm living in, maybe you want to go somewhere else, but it's your choice. However, there is a fourth one, and I think uh, Shanti has already made a promotion for that. We have some teachers really from the field here. They have prepared TED Talk style presentations. You would hear seven stories from four countries, from Cambodia, from Vietnam, from the Philippines, and from Indonesia. So if you choose, like you want to listen to some real teachers who are really working in challenging environments and hear their stories, that will be in the fourth room, session 5D. And they have an awesome moderator, me. No. But anyway, if you are fed up with me, you don't come to 5D. But otherwise, it's a great session. So please join. So uh, then the last thing is, very last thing, after we are finished with the program, approximately at 5.45, because we are 15 minutes behind schedule, 5.45, we are going to meet anybody who is still here and would like to network. You are invited by the Asian Development, by Shanti and her team, to attend a cocktail and network reception. There are some great books to be launched. There is a cultural show and there are some snacks. Okay, so at six o'clock. A lot of information. Thank you dear, very much, dear class. Time for networking, half an hour. And when you hear the sound signals, please proceed to the room of your choice. Thank you very much for joining the plenaries today. <laughs>